Welcome to the second video of rebuilding a 3D printed humanoid robot. Previously, I showed off my old robot project from a year ago and explained my plans for this year's project reboot. In this video, we're getting right to work. I have a CAD model for Endeavor 2 to show you all, and we'll follow up with some 3D printing action. We'll calibrate the servos, then get to building, stopping short of adding electronics or programming since I want to save that for the next video. But with that, Let's jump right into Fusion 360 and show you what I got. So here's the CAD model. This started in December and lasted to mid-February. The main goals for the CAD design were as follows. Uh, improve joint stability, especially with the shoulder, bicep, and torso joints. Tighten the cable routing, make it serviceable. Improve structural integrity, make it easy to build and use, and general quality of life fixes. So let's talk through what changed in detail. The internal electronics within the torso were completely redone. This was driven by the switch to this larger LiPo battery, which can have at least twice the battery capacity as the original. You can get even higher capacities for the same form factor, if you're willing to spend more for this particular battery brand, which is neat. The dimensions of the battery forced me to rearrange how everything was laid out, so I put the battery up in front and had it accessed from the top side when the cover was removed, like so. Down below, I replaced the 30 amp relay for a smaller 10 amp relay. I didn't really have a reliable way to measure the current draw of the robot, so out of safety I went with a larger module. However, I think I could get away with it since the Maker Pet Hexapod uses the smaller relay and never had problems. The Servo 2040 was repositioned so that the servo cables come out of this cutout in the top cover. So no more wire jungle, at least from the servo cables. The ESP32 was moved out of the torso and mounted to the back plate, which is protected by the hinge cover. My idea for the firmware rewrite was to make the ESP32 do the heavy lifting, and have the servo 2040 be like a flash once thing that simply moves the servos where the ESP32 tells it to. This is so I can have a more pleasant experience programming the robot by only needing one microcontroller to flash. Also, I added a physical power switch. What I did before was hot plugging the XT60 connections, which is bad practice for power electronics. Also, if I decide to go to Robo 1, the rules state that a power switch is needed. All of the servo joints were pretty much reworked, so if we look at the left arm here, the joints that could be supported on both ends now use a screw sleeve. If I can move it out to show you. Looks like this, and it basically it slips through a bearing and fastens to the servo assembly back here. The original design had something similar going, however the cap was wide and took three screws each. Furthermore, the cap didn't fasten to the servo, meaning that the flange was allowed to flex. This new version is smaller, reduces part count, and offers better structural rigidity. To support the single under joints such as the torso, shoulder, and bicep, I designed ring brackets with 6mm steel balls. So here's one here, one down here for the torso, and one more here for the bicep. This was to distribute the load away from the servo shaft and reduce the wobbling effect that would have resulted without it. I sort of did this with the original design using airsoft ammunition, but that was a last minute hotfix and the plastic wore off quickly. With this I'm hoping I don't need to go in and tighten the joints as often as I did, although the torso joint remains a bit tricky to get to, but I expect the changes to the electronics mounting will make the process a bit more friendlier. The thigh and ankle brackets were segmented into plates that bolt together. Initially, these two segments were joined with the base flange, but printing these as one piece was a mistake because the part strength tends to be weaker when loads are applied normal to the print layers. Furthermore, if I look at this cross section, the part strength is based on this small surface area of solid material. I made this mistake with Endeavor 1's shoulder and elbow brackets, the former of which broke during a test run at the RoboGames venue. My matches were a day after, but I had time to reprint the segmented version of the brackets. Moral of the story, printing these as separate pieces should increase the strength of these components, even though I'll need a few more screws to do it. Aside from that, I replaced all external socket head screws with flathead screws, with this conical shape to help with alignment. It also makes the robot look sleeker with the flush surfaces. I also reduced the screw count for sub-assemblies with extraneous holes wherever possible. Lastly, I did some detailing work and added text, stripes, and a logo. I got a new 3D printer with a multi-material filament loader for Black Friday, so doing these bits in a different color was possible. Overall, I'm very satisfied with how the redesign turned out. 
I feel confident that the changes I made will result in more robust robot than the original design. However, there's only one way to find out for sure, and that's by printing the pieces and putting it together. Overall, I have very little to complain about regarding the quality of these prints. Everything looks clean and is dimensioned accurately, and I especially like the multicolored details. The printer I used for Endeavor 1 was an Ender 3, but there are a few problems with it. I had some z-axis skew, and the cold weather made quality control difficult. Now that I switched to the Bamboo Labs P1S, which didn't need much manual setup from my end, I'm feeling very good about these parts. Not saying that you need one of these printers specifically. Just as long as your printer is properly calibrated, then anything goes really. By the way, if you're printing these parts after I've released the files, some parts have a sacrificial one layer overhang. These were implemented in counterbores extruded from the bottom layer to help with the print quality, or these just poke through the hole with a cutting tool or hobby knife and clean it up. Before I start putting things together, there's something I'd like to do beforehand, and that's calibrating the servos. This was something the Maker Pet Hexapod robot did, but I didn't mainly due to hindsight. Servo manufacturers list the angle range alongside the pulse width range, which is arguably more important because you're sending a pulse width modulation signal to the servo, not the angle. For the DS3235, it lists 500 to 2500 microseconds for an angle range of 180 or 270 degrees depending on what option you select. However, this can vary due to servo quality and manufacturing variations which is why we need a tool to measure the angles and map them to the correct pulse widths. I made this jig that mounts above the servos that indicates 45 degree angle increments. A dial attaches to the servo hub to show where the angle is at. I hooked this to an Arduino that is controlled through a serial monitor on my computer. First, it will go to the theoretical neutral position at 1500 microseconds. If needed, I can pop the servo hub off and reposition it so the dial is as close to the center mark as possible. It doesn't need to be perfect, since that's what calibration is for. Next, it will ask us to calibrate the servo's neutral position by using the keyboard to rotate the servo dial towards the middle mark. The process is then repeated for the plus 90 and minus 90 degree ends of the jig. After that, the servo can be controlled by providing an angle input rather than pulse width. This serves as a sanity check to make sure the angles correspond to the jig markings. It's not a perfect process, but given the limitations of RC servos, it is a needed step, especially for a robot that requires joint accuracy. Anyways, I did this for all 17 servos, which were taken from the prototype and labeled so I can keep track of the calibration data for when I do the firmware. I'm glad I did this before assembling the robot, because I would need to disassemble the robot to calibrate, then put it back together. It would have been very messy. By the way, when you disassemble the jig, make sure that only the printed dial is removed from the servo, and not the servo hub because otherwise you'll need to redo the calibration. Uh... The Arduino code and cap files for the calibration jig are in the GitHub repository linked below. Now that the servos are calibrated, let's get the build started. All servos go into a printed housing, which protects the servos and serves as a connection point for other structural components. Each servo has a specific housing it mounts into, depending on which servo it is. Next, I'm building one of four rear linkage assemblies, which takes the servo block and fastens two of these plates on both ends. I'm also inserting a hex rod that is locked between the two plates, which is used to allow rotating joints to connect to each other. I'm now building one of four front linkage assemblies. Nothing too special here, just two hinge brackets that connect to a front cover piece. 
Now I'm building the thigh bracket. This is structurally similar to the ankle bracket, but I found alignment a bit tricky since parts are fastened at right angles, but it's doable. These brackets also take a 8mm bearing to support the actuated joints. Next, the knee assembly. It's a similar process as building the front linkage assemblies, but I'm putting two hex rods and a bearing in as well. Next, the feet. I made them bulkier than Endeavor 1's because the old feet flexed under load, causing a swinging motion after the robot stopped walking. Hopefully the extra rigidity here will stop that problem. Now we can put the full leg together. It's important to attach the servo in its neutral position, which I marked with a sharpie during the calibration process. You should never need to rotate the servo hub for alignment. For our case, the neutral position for the legs should result in a vertical leg assembly if the hubs were not messed with. Now adding the front linkage, threading M4 bolts through the hex rod to form a hinge joint. This process continues upwards until we have a completed leg assembly. On to the pelvis. The two thigh and torso blocks are sandwiched between the two mounting brackets. And up top there's an additional bracket to hold the steel balls for the torso joint support. Up above, I'm mounting the torso bottom plate to keep the balls in place. Now for the torso. First I'm gluing the yellow vent pieces into the servo blocks, just for aesthetics. Next, the side plates bolt into the servo blocks. I'm attaching the back plate to the bottom plate first. Then comes the side pieces. The hinge back cover also comes on and pops into place. Now for the front cover. Working on the shoulder bracket next. These are attached to the shoulder servos after the ball brackets are mounted. We'll set the torso aside for later. Let's do the arms, starting with the forearm. Now for the elbow bracket. The bicep assembly is next. This consists of two servo blocks joined together by two mounting brackets. Adding another ball bracket. Then attaching the elbow to the bicep assembly. Afterwards, the forearm comes on. Now we can start piecing everything together, starting with the arms. Finally, the legs. Actually, I forgot a step, and that's putting the head together.
And finally, we're finished with the structural build. Overall, I'm really happy with the redesign. The build process took around maybe a combined 5 hours. I could probably do it in half the time if I built a second unit, which I'm actually thinking about doing using the parts from Endeavor 1. Structurally, everything feels very sturdy. This was one of my gripes with the original version, because I designed with the intention to transition to carbon fiber or sheet metal, so some pieces were a bit thin. It seems I've also fixed the joint issue. There's no play or wiggle, and I get the vibe that I won't need to service the joints as often as I did for Endeavor 1. And of course, I'm loving the aesthetics. The redesigned head and the multi-material details make it look like a size down Gundam, and it's just right up my alley. Of course, all that's left to do is wire it up and make it move, which is what we'll be doing in the third video. I'll be writing similar firmware as Endeavor 1 to start, and in subsequent videos I wish to experiment with advanced and smart controls. If you enjoyed this video and wish to keep up with the project, I'd appreciate if you can leave a like and hit the subscribe button. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.